as much as we could argue that we made a lot of progress in the cloud, I think there is still like you know, the majority of the progress that needs to happen is ahead of us. And as much as you got to know Google and Microsoft and Amazon, the three hyperscalers today, there's still a ton of innovation, you know, abilities and capabilities and possibilities for startups, can I think? Welcome to Founded and Funded. I'm Madrona Digital Editor, Coral garnick Deccan, here with our next investor spotlight, featuring Madrona Managing Director, Soma Soma Seeger. These investor spotlights are meant to give founders and entrepreneurs an idea of what drives our investors and what they're looking for in founders. Soma first came to Madrona in 2015 after a successful 27-year career at Microsoft, where he was most recently the SVP of the developer division. He's also been a longtime angel investor, and of course, he recently led an initiative to create Major League Cricket in the U.S. and landed us a team here in Seattle, the Orcas. At Madrona, Soma has invested in companies like Snowflake and UiPath, which of course are both now public companies, and he works with companies like Statsig, Pulumi, Typeface, Relational AI, Seekout, and Bobsled, just to name a few. Welcome, Soma. Thanks so much for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here on this podcast. Well, so to kick us off, you were at Microsoft for almost three decades. Why the heck did you leave and what made you choose Madrona? <laughs> I think that's a great question. <laughs> You know, to, to be honest, once I had crossed the 25-year mark at Microsoft, if you'd asked me, like, you know, hey, what, 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 what do I think I'd be doing? I'd say, like, you know, hey, maybe another 20 years at Microsoft kind of thing. So it wasn't like, you know, that I had this long-term dream of, like, you know, after so many years at Microsoft, I need to go be a venture capitalist. There wasn't a, a, a well-thought-out plan or anything like that. But then what happened was I could see myself probably at Microsoft for maybe 10 more years kind of thing. And then I was wondering, would I have the same level of energy and enthusiasm and excitement? Uh, and that got me thinking about like, you know, how do I want to shape the, the next 25 years of my life kind of thing? And I thought like, you know, hey, it wouldn't hurt to think about something different. And particularly, I, I was like, you know, sort of so much in love with Microsoft that I was thinking like, you know, hey, if working in a company is going to be exciting for me, I should just continue at Microsoft. There is no reason to leave Microsoft to say like, you know, hey, let me go find another job. So that left me with like really like only two things to do if I left Microsoft. One was to start a company. The second thing was to become an investor. And I can tell you that I did think for about like you know, a few months and said like, you know, hey, is there some idea that I'm going to be so passionate about that I'm willing to get out of the bed and slog for the next 10, 15, 20 years kind of thing? And I should tell you that I was coming up a little short at the time. Okay. <laughs> so, so I said like, you know, hey, what is the next best thing? Particularly, like, you know, the amount of time I'd spent building products and building technology in a company like Microsoft, if I can take all of that operating experience and if I can, you know, help the next generation entrepreneurs build the next set of enterprises and next set of large companies, I thought that might be an interesting way to productively spend the next part of my life. And then once I made the decision, it was clear that I needed to be an investor somewhere. I should tell you this, like, you know, uh, I did talk to a couple of people before I made, my, made up my mind. And uh, one of them said, like, you know, hey, I'm so glad that you're thinking about being an investor. Why don't you pack your bags and come on over to the valley? You know, in, in some sense, you could argue, like, you know, at least, like, you know, the center of action to a certain extent is happening there. Now, in the last eight years, like, you know, I think there are more spokes that are becoming stronger and stronger, including our own Seattle. But I, I should tell you that, like, you know, for me, Seattle has been home for the last, you know, 35 years or so. So this feels home to me. And you got two of the... Uh, world's largest market cap companies in our backyard with, between Microsoft and Amazon. And the startup ecosystem seems to be growing from strength to strength. And I said, like, hey, why not stay here and do my part to continue scaling and nurturing that ecosystem? So it was probably like, you know, a 10 minute thinking and a decision for me to say, hey, I'm going to stay in Seattle. I'm not going to go to the move to the Bay Area. And then, like, you know, I, this is, I'm not saying it in an arrogant way. But to me, like, you know, hey, the only firm that mattered if you're going to stay in uh, Seattle is Madrona. And I should also tell you that Madrona was kind enough to say, like, you know, hey, come on over. That's pretty great. Did you have to, like, woo them or had they already been in touch at some point? Uh, it, it, it was sort of interesting, right? The one guy that I knew a little bit at Madrona is uh, Tim Porter, our own Tim Porter. Because Tim was also at Microsoft and he was in Corp Dev and I was running Dev Dev. And so we had known each other a little bit. So we, we were having coffee and I was telling Tim that like, you know, hey, in the next six months, maybe I might do something different kind of thing. 
And before I realized there were like, you know, half a dozen conversations, you know, getting to know people at Moderna. And they were also realistic about it. They said like, hey, you're coming from a large environment like Microsoft. Okay. Don't know how you're going to transition to being a venture capitalist. I hear you that you're interested in this. Why don't you come here? Uh, Let's get to know you. You get to know us. And then if we like it in a year or two, we can sort of formalize that kind of thing. Uh, But the good news is we didn't have to take a long time. I think it was clear to me and it was hopefully it was clear to them that like, you know, hey, this this might be a, a good win-win for all kind of thing. And so uh, here I am eight, eight years later. So now when you kind of look at what you're looking forward to, what categories are you focusing on? You know, what interests you the most in terms of founders and teams that are coming and talking to you? I should tell you, if I don't mention AI here, nobody's going to listen to this podcast. <laughs> 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 but having said that, I would say like, you know, we as a firm, and uh, me included, we are spending a fair amount of time on uh, what I call AI and generative AI companies. The good news, uh, Coral, as you probably know, is we've been investing in uh, AI companies in one way, shape, or form for about 11, 12 years now. So this is not new for us, but I would say definitely in the last two years or three years, the pace of activity as it relates to AI investments has gone up significantly. So that's sort of one area that I'm definitely spending spending a fair amount of time kind of thing. But other than that, I continue to spend a bunch of time on what I call cloud infrastructure, particularly as it relates to like, you know, uh, DevOps, management, security, and the whole like, because as much as we could argue that we made a lot of progress in the cloud, I think there is still like, you know, the majority of the progress that needs to happen is ahead of us as opposed to behind us. And as much as you got, you know, Google and Microsoft and Amazon, the three hyperscalers today, there's still a ton of innovation, you know, abilities and capabilities and possibilities for startups. So I continue you know, looking at that space. The other thing, you know, particularly as it relates to AI, one of the things that we've been talking about for the last five, six years, or maybe even eight years now, uh, Coral, is the notion of intelligent applications. We fundamentally believe that every application has to be an intelligent application for it to survive, let alone thrive. And what do I mean when I say an intelligent application? Applications have access to more and more data every day that goes by. We need to create a a self-learning system, okay? so that the application can continue learning, continue getting better with more data that results in generating more data that results in more training and more learning. So that self-learning system is what I think every application should have it as a core part kind of thing, right? So we've been talking about this for the last seven, eight years now. And uh, I think now is the time for us to double down and say, hey, what is happening in the application space, particularly as it relates to AI and generative AI, and how can we be part of that disruptive innovation that is happening today and is likely to happen in the coming decade. And so as you get approached by all these founders and, and teams with their ideas, you know, there's a lot of companies that approach you, of course. So how do you evaluate the founders or the teams, you know, depending on their structure? What is it that you're looking for? It, it's sort of a, a two different stories there, okay? Because as the company sort of finds product market fit and ready to scale, you can look at metrics, you can look at data, you can look at, you can do what I call data-driven analysis and decide, hey, does this feel like a good investment or like, you know, not kind of thing, right? But most of our investments, as you know, correlate Moderna are what I call early stage investments. You know, oftentimes we got one or two founders and, a, and maybe a slide deck or a document and that's all we have. So there isn't too much data kind of thing per se about the company's history or the company's trajectory or the company's progress kind of thing. So then you're sort of, you know, down to thinking about like, you know, what we typically refer to at Moderna as founder market fit. Now, we think about like, you know, hey, is the problem that the founder is looking to solve a real problem that has got a large addressable opportunity? You know, why is now the right time for this problem to be solved? And can this problem be solved in a way that is going to be 10x or better than what is out there? And finally, more importantly, is this the team that is going to go deliver on that? If right. these things come together, which we call sort of founder market fit, then that's what we look for. That's what I look for in saying like, hey, is this something that I want to take a bet on, that I want to be a part of? Because anytime you take a bet, you make an investment coral. As you know, we are here from day one for the long run, which means like, you know, we are thinking about at least a 10, 12, 15 year journey. And we want it to be that long because it takes that long to generate a good amount of enterprise value kind of thing, right? So you need to know that you're willing to spend a good amount of time for the next decade or more 
with this founding team or this set of founders and this company and this problem space. So it's a, it's a very important decision. In fact, I would say the most important decision that we make uh, at Medina is like, you know, when we decide to take a bet on a founder or a founding team and say like, you know, hey, we're going to invest here or kind of thing. Is there a single attribute or anything like that that you think is like a common thread throughout the founders that you tend to work with? I think the first thing that comes to my mind is passion. A phenomenal amount of passion to solve the problem that they are focused on solving. In some sense, like, you know, I want to see them being consumed, you know, day, night, you know, sleeping, awake, whatever it is kind of thing, because that's what it is going to take to go build something and get it to scale and success. So passion for the problem is something that I uh, look at. Then other things like, you know, hey, are you going to be scrappy enough? Are you willing to listen? Are you coachable? Are you, are you going to have a strong point of view? And sometimes you're going to listen to the coaching and sometimes you're going to say, no, this is the right thing to do kind of thing. So you want to come in with a point of view, strong point of view, but be open-minded about it. And finally, do you know how to build a, a strong team around you that can follow you? So these are some of the attributes that we look at when we look at like, you know, the founder or the founders. Okay, so wrapping up, just a couple of kind of quick hit questions for you. Um, first being, are there one or two books or podcasts that you tend to recommend for founders or future founders? I would say there are two books that come to my mind. One is, you know, by now it is a little older book, but I still will tell you that I, I love that book. It's a book called Good to Great by Jim Collins. Okay. Now that book was written like, you know, probably a decade ago or even long, much longer than a decade, you know, maybe 15 years ago or whatever this kind of thing. But the reason I like that book, and I think every founder should be reading that book, is because the, the principles for leadership and management that are written in the book, I think, A, are timeless, and B, are as applicable to a day zero founder as it is to a, somebody who's running a large company. The other book that came out a few years ago that I thought was, was, was really apt for entrepreneurs and people who are starting to think about like, you know, what they want to do and how they have to think big kind of thing is this book called Zero to One uh, by Peter Thiel. So what's your favorite thing to do when you're not working, not in board meetings, not helping founders, which takes a lot of time. You work with a lot of people, you give a lot. So what do you, what do, you do to unwind or kind of just relax? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, I, I can tell you what I'm doing and I, I can't tell you whether I'm doing that because that's unwinding and relaxing or that's just more work. <laughs> <laughs> but really, like, you know, one of the things that I've been involved in for the last uh, several years now, Coral, is figuring out how to bring the sport of cricket uh, to the U.S. and particularly to Seattle and to the Northwest. As you know, we launched a major league cricket uh, tournament in the U.S. last year. So I think we are still sort of laying the foundation for that. So to me, like, you know, it's almost like, you know, if you talk to Akila, my wife, she'll tell you that, like, you know, hey, uh, every waking moment outside of Medina is going towards, like, you no know, cricket kind of thing, right? So that, that's what I've been spending my time over the last several years. That is definitely an additional full-time job on top of what you already do. So, yeah, Other than this, like, you know, I really like, you know, like spending time with my family. And so to me, work and family is probably where I spend the most time. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Soma. I loved getting to know you a little better. Thanks, Coral. Thank, thanks for doing this. Mm -hmm.